Howdy. Welcome to Free Speech Zone. It's January 17th, and uh, we've got a lot of news to cover today. If you know somebody who is conditioned to accepting the official story no matter what, every time you hear Fox News or NBC News or some other news like that tell you something, do they believe every word that's said? Well, maybe you ought to draw them near the TV set right now because... We've done it again, folks. Remember how I've talked about before? I've even played a clip where uh, James Corbett laid out how almost every single terrorist attack that you can think of was an FBI plot, including 9-11. So let's uh, take that with a grain of salt for right now, and let's move on. How about, remember the shoe bomber? The Portland shoe bomber? Yeah, Matalib. Okay, what a lame excuse, but that was an FBI plot that went awry. They, they had the guy so doped up, he, could, he couldn't even talk. And uh, that was our terrorist. Well, guess what? It turns out that the, the uh, terrorism, quote terrorism, they call it terrorism now. They don't break it down to what each incident's about. They just call it terrorism as if there's such a thing. You know, a universal terrorism. Every time there's fighting going on, it's terrorism. We'll get into that a little bit more later. But... The French massacre that just occurred turns out that the people that did that massacre trained by the FBI and lived with Mutalib. How about that? Let's let's play this Alex Jones clip, and this will blow your minds. We'll be back in about 20 minutes. And we now know that the three shooters were being handled by the known double, triple agent of Al-Qaeda working for some of the crooks at the Pentagon, Anwar al And that is now in mainstream news and that one of the shooters from the Paris attacks lived with Mutalib, the biggest patsy in the known universe, drugged, put on the flight with no ID, no visa, passport, came out in congressional testimony that an unnamed U.S. agency pressured the Dutch to get him on the plane in Amsterdam in its flight bound into Detroit, Michigan. We, of course, broke that first with the lawyers that were witnesses to it, the husband and wife lawyers. We had Kurt Haskell on the broadcast. And then months later on C-SPAN, we have that clip coming up. It was confirmed. Well, he saw the sharp breaths man arguing when Matalab didn't have IDs and getting him on the plane. Suspected parachuter lived with underwear bomber in Yemen. The underwear bombing was completely staged. We'll prove it when we come back. Now we know what happened. They were definitely protected by the West, and they were allowed to train in an area given to them by NATO and by Turkey. So up the chain, up river, the West created this terror group. Let's start with... Uh, the airport adventures, which they now admit are going nationwide with the Viper teams at bus stops, train stops, the streets, shopping malls, random vans, sending you through body scanners, biometrically scanning 360, your naked body. Now, I've seen more in-depth images by the actual companies where they can zoom in on pores. Okay, so they're showing you a low-res image, but totally naked. Your family, it's child porn. They don't care. Uh, now, if you take a picture of your two-year-old daughter in diapers, and this, this made ABC News and CNN, the children's bottoms weren't even seen, but because the children were had towels around them hugging. That was a three-year-old and two-year-old. They were arrested. Their children were taken. So that's th things that aren't bad are called bad. But then the government recording your naked wife, you, your children, and now they're going in at all major airports, 214, and their uh, people in Houston are being forced through them. But people are refusing and saying, no, you perverts, you're not going to do that. So Aaron Dykes and Rob Dew back from six days of adventure uh, with uh, the police state in Canada and the U.S. Uh, tell us what happened. Well, I got hit up first. This was in uh, D.C. flying to Detroit. Because you got long hair. You get pulled right. out every time. Some <laughs> like kind of Al-Qaeda. But uh, what I, Aaron was already through um, security, and I walked through, and they go, oh, sir, can you step in here? And I said, uh, so what's that? And they said, oh, this is our RFID scanner. And I said, no, I'm not going in there. 
and uh, what do you mean? And I said, I'm not going in there. I don't. I said, I don't agree with that. And they said, oh, well, it's voluntary. I said, well, good, I'm not doing it. Yeah, but so that's like SeaWorld made you oh, thumbprint. Right. At first it was voluntary. Now it's mandatory. It's like dog training. Passengers describe a terror attack and the arrest of a suspect who tried to blow up a plane as it landed at Metro Airport. We heard a loud pop, then a bit of a smoke. It sounded first like a balloon being popped. All of a sudden, heard some screams and flight attendants ran up and down the, the aisles. and. Everything's crazy. People are screaming. There's fire on the plane. So there was a lady shouting back and she was saying, uh, Things like, uh, what are you doing, what are you doing? Um, and uh, at that moment, I was sure I was going to die. And we're learning tonight more about the suspect. Let's get to Fox News' Andrea Isom. She begins our team coverage. She is live at Metropolitan Airport. Andrea? As the hours go on, you are right. We are learning more about the suspect, and quite frankly, the details are chilling. The man, the menace, 23-year-old Abdul Mudala of Nigeria. Mudala's despicable actions were all on Al-Qaeda's behalf. Sources telling Fox News his instructions were to blow up the plane over U.S. soil. The intelligence community knew about Umar Farouk Abdul-Muttalib weeks ago and failed to spread word that would have put him on the no-fly list. The father of the suspect in the Christmas incident warned U.S. officials in Africa about his son's extremist views that a report was prepared and it was sent on to the CIA in Langley, Virginia, CIA headquarters, but it was not disseminated to the wider intelligence community. Obviously, when you have a father coming in and talking to the embassy about a son who's radicalized, gives the embassy the passport number, the first thing you would think is a, a very fast effort to see if the person's got a visa and suspend the visa. One of the things you don't know about is the number of people that we have turned away because their name has been on the watch list uh, or on the no-fly list. Only my mom could, but not me and my dad, because both me and my dad are, are on the watch list. Tough to believe, but eight years later, we are still talking about connecting the dots at a failure to communicate. Call for immediate reviews on how this guy got on the plane and how he was able to get some explosives on the plane. Uh, this is a, uh, a controlled patsy. Facts are facts. You can have your own opinions, but you can't have your own facts. And we have this, uh, this same pattern that we've seen again and again. We have these individuals that have very limited mental equipment, but nevertheless, they're able to work miracles. In other words, they can do things that a normal person would never be able to do. You'd be arrested, you'd be questioned, you'd be searched, you'd be stopped in some way. He gets out of countries, he's disheveled, looks like he's drugged, <laughs> stumbling around. I mean, this is classic. He doesn't, he doesn't get on any serious uh, list of, uh, for scrutiny or, or special search. And then we have this famous story of the well-dressed Indian who accompanies him. I saw two men and they caught my eye because they seemed to be an odd pair. One was uh, what I would describe as a poor looking black teenager around 16 or 17. And the other, the other man, a, a age 50-ish, uh, wealthy looking Indian man. And I was just wondering why they were together kind of strange and I watched them approach what I would call the, the ticket agent, the final person that checks your boarding pass before you get on the plane. He gets from one plane to another thanks to this Patsy Minder, a Patsy Chaperone or Patsy Monitor. The only person that spoke was the Indian man and what he said was uh, this man needs to board the plane but he doesn't have a passport and the ticket agent responded well if he doesn't have a passport you can't get on the plane to which the Indian man responded back, uh, he's from Sudan, we do this all the time. And the ticket agent said, well then you'll have to go and talk to my manager. And she directed them down a hallway. Uh, and, and that was the last time that I saw the Indian man mm -hmm. and the black man I didn't see again until he tried to blow up our plane. Then I'd be interested to see, is there a passport? Won't the FBI please show us a passport if there is one. They won't release the videos from Amsterdam. I mean, this is suspicious. Oh, yes. I think it's beyond suspicious. It's a clear case of a patsy. So he's a controlled asset. 
And of course, it's not a matter of failure to connect the dots. We're hearing all about the unconnected dots. No, this is the desired outcome. Let me just point out a couple of other things here. Uh, we're told that uh, the, uh, the this uh, alleged uh, bomber, right, the uh, Nicker bomber, whatever they call him, uh, he was in contact with this character, Aulaki, in Yemen. And of course, he, this Aulaki, I call him Aulaki the CIA lackey. Aulaki the lackey, and remember, he's a CIA lackey. He's a double agent, a triple agent, if you want. He is used uh, as a kind of beacon to recruit patsies across the world. And they can always sheep dip somebody like Major Hassan. If they want to say, you're linked to Al-Qaeda, they just have you exchange a few emails with this Aulaki, and that's what he's good for, right? He goes back to 9-11 in Hani Hanjour. So this this guy, is uh, he's, he's, a, he's a U.S. agent under whatever layers of, of garb that he's got. The other thing is, how was this uh, young uh, patsy, uh, Omar Farouk Mutalab, how was he radicalized? And I think we're getting some pretty good indications that it's this Brixton Mosque, Finsbury Mosque, Access in London, the school for patsies, the, the British patsies. Which, patsy. by the way, six months ago, I remember it, you predicted we'd see plane bombings out of that mosque. It, this is not so hard to do. Remember Richard Reed, Richard Reed, mentally retarded vagrant who was sleeping on the floor of Brixton Mosque, I think. He was given the same PETN uh, explosive by somebody, so that's what this, this uh, Omar Farouk was given then, allegedly, once again, in in Yemen. So you can see it, it all it fits together, and it, it all comes from these same, these same places. There are reports today that the Christmas Day body bomber met with an American-born radical cleric, Anwar al-Awlaki. He's believed to be living in Yemen, al-Awlaki is. He's not only been linked to al-Qaeda in the past, but he reportedly exchanged emails with the suspected Fort Hood shooter, Nadal Hassan, before that shooting massacre in Texas. I would also point out that the security company at Schiphol Airport is ICTS, which is a uh, Israeli-owned firm. They were the same firm that allowed Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, to board the flight, the American Airlines flight to Miami. Same, uh, uh, same uh, uh, explosive uh, material was found in his shoes as was found in Mr. Mutalib's underwear. They ignored the threats on purpose. Obviously, this, uh, w you know, we had a lot of people sitting at home over the Christmas holidays, families gathered around a television set. Uh, yeah, another terror attack, huge problems for travel now. When we talk about screenings at the airport and, and other protective mechanisms along the way, w what should we be doing that clearly we're not? The scanning machines that we currently are beginning to deploy in the U.S. that would give us the ability to see what someone has concealed underneath their clothes. These body scanners are the key with like, uh, you know, these different psychological syndromes where people serve the abuser. Yeah, because uh, that's what you have to get in as to where this is going. It's not fun. It's degradation. It's the dehumanization of the individual. So really, what they're telling you is not only do you not own, own your body, you own nothing. You don't even own the patterns to your own genes. They're telling you you're a piece of property. What do they do when you first come into a prison? They strip you and do a medical exam to humiliate you. They hold you down in front of the other prisoners and they laugh at you, make jokes about you. When Aaron went through, it was even worse because I was behind him. Yeah, I went through. He told me to go through the scanner and I said no. He said, why aren't you going to do it? I said, it violates my privacy. And, and this is what happened. This guy got scared. This guy was <gasps> bigger than me. He was athletic. Ooh. He started shaking when I said no. You think it doesn't matter to well, Because it's no. a delusional world. He thought he found a real terrorist. Yeah. He was shaking, visibly shaking, when I said no. And he tried to trick me to go through it again and told me they were going to body wand me, which they ended up doing. And then he tells me, oh, because I don't like it, because it violates my Fourth Amendment, I read too much. Oh, you're one of those who reads too much. And you said he put his hands on you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, he grabbed me. I him, said no. Like this. He started shaking. He didn't know what to do. And then his first flinch reaction was to grab my arm and try to pull me through the scanner. It was absolutely crazy. And you got women apologizing to the agents. I'm so sorry. I forgot my mascara and my lipstick. And the Fourth Amendment says if you're going to search, you're not only going to have a warrant, you're going to say specifically what you're looking for. But, but, but it's not specific. It's liquids. It's lipstick. It could be shoes. It could be breaking the will of the people. The real purpose of body scanners. And you scroll down, it shows the Nazis and others strip searching women in World War II. I tell you what I would do personally. I would just take uh, photographs of all the mass graves of World War II and the Soviet Union 
of all the naked bodies and having placards of that. And Genius! And saying, we're not going to end up like this, no thank you. Great idea, pointing out that they always strip you down before they kill you. I mean, it's a real act of submission. Do you agree with me that this telling ev everyone you will be naked body scanned is a key point in our conditioning and we must resist it? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It's an ongoing process of the uh, personalization, dehumanization, and getting the public to accept the fact that they're nothing but cattle. Once you're on the plane, you're coming into Detroit, what happens next? The pilot comes on the speaker and he says, we have 10 minutes to landing flight crew, take your seats and buckle up. A, uh, a flight attendant walks by my seat mumbling to herself, something smells like smoke. I looked up, I'm in row 27. Uh, I could see smoke coming from row 19, eight rows up. Uh, it looked, it wasn't a lot of smoke at that time. And it looked like it was coming from the floor. So I, uh, I unbuckled my seatbelt, took a few steps up the aisle to get a better look. And, uh, and then it burst into flames across the floor of the seats and up the wall to the ceiling. When it burst into flames, people were screaming, fire, fire. Uh, terrorists, water, 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 we need water, somebody get water. Uh, flight attendants were screaming. The pilot comes on the intercom and says emergency landing and starts speeding up. And while this is going on, the, the terrorist man's being hauled off into the first class area by a couple passengers. We are five days into this and we've not seen any surveillance footage. The media doesn't seem concerned about uh, eye eyewitnesses seeing a man videotaping the whole flight aimed at this guy. When we first took off, I noticed about 10 seats ahead of us to the left-hand side. He uh, had a camcorder, and I didn't think much of it. I thought maybe this was his first flight and was just excited. And then when the actual incident occurred, I looked up, and he was the only one standing and filming the entire thing. That's obvious an accomplice or a handler or something. Uh, we've got this other guy getting him through security. I mean, any other comments? When we were being detained in Detroit, we were held uh, in an area of a, of a baggage claim area. That all the passengers from our flight, there was nobody uh, except for some law enforcement personnel. After we had been there for about an hour, all the time with our carry-on bags, three bomb-sniffing dogs were brought in. One of them sat down by the bag that was brought in by him the man in orange. He had an orange. He appeared to be of Indian or Pakistani or some similar descent, maybe around age 30. He was walked back to a room, not in handcuffs. Uh, he went in the door. He was in there approximately an hour. When he came out, he was handcuffed, taken away. A, an FBI officer came up to the group of the rest of us passengers and said the following, which is not exact, but close. You're being moved to another area. It's not safe here. I'm sure all of you saw what just happened and can figure out why you're being moved. We were taken to a customs area and uh, they brought bomb dogs and uh, checked all the luggage with that. Uh, another person was taken aside and handcuffed and brought out uh, and we were moved into another room for safety reasons, they told us. My story on this has been the same all along and uh, the FBI now has five versions of their story, which I clearly lay out with the time period and with each version, and they're just not, they're not credible. There is absolutely no excuse for the reason why, number one, we're left on the plane for 20 minutes, not knowing if there is another bomb there. Number two, security allowing us to take our carry-on bags off the plane, and we stood there with all of our bags together, for an hour until the bomb sniffing dogs arrive. Uh, and then, you know, after they found one, well, then we're moved to another area and now they don't want to talk about the man who was taken away. You were there, they didn't stop him for immigration violations. The dog went over and sat down in front of his bag, the alert right. for explosives. Right, exactly. Unless this is a passport sniffing dog. Uh, this is a huge story, one of the biggest out there. The FBI is on this full time. They know what's going on. Why are they being dishonest? And, and, and how do we investigate this when the investigators themselves are engaged in clear obstruction of the truth? You know, I don't know how else to take it. It's either utter incompetence or intentionally hiding something, you know, and I don't know how to take it. And still, we're now, what, eight, nine days 
into this and we still haven't seen the Amsterdam footage. Well, and also, why aren't we seeing the video of when he's going through uh, metal detector, passport check, you know, and boarding? You know, this is a modern airport. You'd think they would have video of all this of some sort. They didn't say, oh, we'll look at that. They just said, no, there was no one helping him, which is very suspicious instead of just putting the footage out. If somebody robs a bank or holds up a gas station, well, there's video footage of the, the incident on the 11 o'clock news, usually that very night. If I'm not correct, well, show the video. What are you hiding? Well, now, Sunday, it came out, what, five days ago, six days ago, authorities were watching different Nigerian on Christmas Day flights, CNN. What a way to take a huge issue and just kind of put it out there like it's milk toast. Okay, there was somebody else. Yeah, they did arrest him, but we're not going to talk about it. Kurt, there's a definite cover-up, and you've been vindicated in triplicate. Not only that, but I don't know if you caught the ABC News article that came out over the weekend. Uh, there were a couple sentences knock in the bottom of this article about female suicide bombers. I don't know if you caught this. No, no, tell us. I'll read it to you word for word. Federal agents also tell ABC News they're attempting to identify a man who passengers said helped Abdul Mutalab change planes for Detroit when he landed in Amsterdam from Lagos, Nigeria. Authorities had initially discounted the passenger account but the agents say there's a growing belief the man may have played a role to make sure Abdul Mutalab did not get cold feet. Oh my God, you've been vindicated by them on that. But obviously they, they think the trail's cold now. They have all the surveillance footage. They were involved in a cover-up. Kurt, this is huge. Well, that, that was my take on it. But unfortunately for ABC News, they buried it in the bottom of a seemingly unrelated article about female suicide bombers heading here from Yemen. Why is this not front page news everywhere, number one? Number two, why are you burying at the bottom of this article? Number three, why did you initially discount my story to begin with? It's not like I'm not credible here. And of course, they had COINTELPRO posing as the Patriot Movement attacking you. Uh, all the usual suspects. I mean, it never ends, Kurt. We are, of course, going to get into the top story today. In plain view, as if it's no big deal, DetroitNews.com. Okay, it was a U.S. government agent that was the smart-dressed man that led Umar Farouk Alamatab, or the underwear bomber, on to the aircraft in Amsterdam. After a month plus of lying and saying that that no such man existed and saying no one else was pulled off the plane in Detroit supposedly with a bomb. Now they've admitted that happened as well. Kurt Haskell, the lawyer, and his lawyer wife, uh, they've both on record have been proven right with other witnesses. And you add how they were already getting in Yemen. That's now confirmed Washington Post. They were planning to already launch a bigger attack, 2,000 troops there. And then right on time, right as the body scanners were scheduled to go in in January nationwide. That was already scheduled, folks. They're, they're saying on the news, oh, now we're doing this. So now I went and looked it up. They were scheduled to go in the additional 214 airports. They were in less than 20. So although we have acquired these machines, they are not as widely deployed as they should be. In your current role as a consultant, do you have an interest in body scanners? I, you know, I, to be, we consult with all kinds of firms, including firms that do manufacture body scanners. You do have some some interest in uh, in, in, in more sales of body scanners. Uh. As well as a lot of other security measures. But I would point out that I've talked about this for probably the last three years. Read what the scanners do to your body. And the TSA guys, again, you need to know why you're going to be dying in five years of cancer. Go ahead. And then we find this uh, article about terahertz waves, which is what they use to do this scanner. Uh, this came in today. And... According to one of their studies, I'm just going to read this real quick. Terahertz waves are in the electromagnetic spectrum between microwaves and infrared. And uh, they pass through non-conductive materials such as clothes, paper, wood, and brick. They say the forces that are generated by these THZ fields are tiny and resonant 
effects that allow the THZ waves to unzip double-stranded DNA, creating bubbles in the strand that could significantly interfere with processes such as gene expression and DNA. Okay, I brought it back just a little bit early so we can cram in the rest of the news that we have. Uh, as you saw there, Chertoff tried to sidestep the fact that he's the uh, owner of the company that makes those scanners and kind of conflict of interest. But isn't that the way we do things nowadays? If you don't have a conflict of interest, <laughs> they don't even want to talk to you. Uh, okay, well, the latest thing, another headline is about the hacking into Sony and how it somehow becomes an American crisis when supposedly Korea hacks into a Japanese company continuing the war between Japan and Korea. Somehow that's an American concern. But the underlying truth is that it was not a hack from Korea to the, China, to the Japanese company. It was an inside job. And they're using it as a false flag to clamp down on internet rights, on internet freedom. Okay, so here is uh, Russia Today with a report on that. We'll be back in about seven minutes. Well, there has been a lot of talk over the last two days about a pro-ISIS group, or even ISIS themselves, hacking into CENTCOM's Twitter or YouTube page. Now let's be clear, anybody can hack a YouTube or Twitter page, it's not difficult. And just because Syncom has a Twitter page doesn't make it any more secure than any other Twitter page. Well, on the heels of that story, President Obama has now come out with suggestions for cybersecurity legislation. Uh, we're going to keep on at this as a government, uh, but we're also going to be working with the private sector to detect, prevent, defend, deter against attacks, and to recover quickly from any disruptions or damage. So what does the president specifically want to see? A bill that would give law enforcement more authority, he says, to criminalize the sale of stolen financial information like credit cards and bank account numbers. Create a federal law that standardizes the requirement that companies notify their customers of security breaches within a specific time frame. And the big one, enabling cybersecurity information sharing between the public and private sectors. Now, all of this is happening as Maryland Congressman Dutch Ruppersberger has said that he will reintroduce the controversial bill CISPA, now called CISA, or the Cyber Intelligence Sharing Act to Congress. By the way, the only difference between the new CISA and the old CISPA, the word protection dropped from the title. The text of the bill, exactly the same. Ruppersberger says that in light of the Sony hack, he believes that now more than ever, we need these cybersecurity bills. Saying in a statement, quote, more recently, Sony was hit by a severe cyber attack by North Korea, the first destructive act attack that we've seen yet. And it cost the company millions of dollars. We must stop dealing with cyber attacks after the fact, end quote. Now, I spoke earlier with cybersecurity expert Eric Delisle, who was also CEO of iCloak, and asked him if anything inside CISPA or the new CISA would have actually prevented the Sony hack. Oh, no. I mean, these, these things are always um, looking into the past, and they're not dealing with things proactively. Uh, they're, they're just ways of trying to discover what happened, frankly. And especially when it comes to issues like CISA and these cybersecurity sharing bills, it really has nothing to do really with security. It has to do with reporting and, and allowing uh, backdoors for the government, does it not? That and uh, quite frankly, it's, uh, it's cover for the corporations um, so that they don't get sued. You know, they're, uh, from my understanding of the bill, they're indemnified. Uh, when they do cooperate in these issues, and they're having to deal with a lot of uh, touchy subjects right now, especially if you look at other areas of the law where uh, privacy protections have been put in place. Uh, for example, HIPAA, uh, which everyone is usually familiar with in healthcare, there are a lot of penalties for companies that are not complying with the law to protect consumers' privacy. Well that's good. We want that uh, to be the case. If we strip away any of those um, reasons for companies because they now have no, uh, there's no recourse in law, then why should they care uh, or put forward the extra money, time and effort that sometimes it takes to, to protect that information? Now, I apologize for my ignorance on this subject, but it occurs to me, and you correct me if I'm wrong, it occurs to me that by the Fed saying that they're going to mandate certain back doors all throughout the Internet and into a lot of these companies, that they're also creating doors that can be accessed by actual hackers. And so aren't they actually creating part of the problem that they're hoping to solve here if they're actually trying to solve issues like what Sony went through? 
Yeah, and this is one of the big challenges that we see in the entire you know information security, cybersecurity space is that um, you know one of the complaints that came out after all of the NSA disclosures was that you know we we learned that the NSA knew about certain exploits uh, that could be accessed by the bad guys and they were not letting people know that these were dangers that were out there. So how could uh, the security companies, the good guys, protect themselves uh, if these holes exist? If they start putting holes in place, it just provides even more attack vectors for uh, the bad guys to exploit. And, and a lot of times it's, it's just counterproductive. Let's talk about the simplicity here of the CENTCOM hacks on Twitter and YouTube. And as we pointed out over and over to people, this is not CENTCOM having their servers hacked. This is Twitter. This is YouTube. And it doesn't matter whether it's a CENTCOM account. They don't have greater security on the CENTCOM Twitter page as you would on any other Twitter page, correct? That's right. It's, I mean, quite frankly, it's the same thing as if someone hacked my Twitter account or your Twitter account. Uh, there's no difference among the Twitter accounts. Uh, and and these are you're you're correct. These are um, this is data that exists on Twitter's and Facebook and any other uh, service providers servers, not the government servers. And you know the government policies, of course, they deal with their own secure documents. And hopefully, uh, our our federal employees that are working with sensitive documents aren't uh, splattering them around on on Facebook and Twitter. If they were, you know, they'd be susceptible to be gotten that way. But this is another case of where the media is really uh, uh, missing both the context and the threat uh, as it really exists. This is a case of where someone has stolen a key to someone's home and they're just a thief. That's all they are. They use that key to unlock their door and go inside and, and do whatever they're going to do. It's not the same as uh, advanced hackers or uh, you know cat burglars who can use these um, uh, lock picking tools to get through the lock, regardless of how strong or how well you secure your keys. So in the case of what's happened with Centcom, somebody, uh, somebody gave up their username and password and someone was able to access it. Now, could that happen through other means that are nefarious, like phishing attacks, where a, uh, the bad guy will send off an email to a government employee that maybe controls that account and says, hey, you need to reset your password, please enter it here, and they surreptitiously uh, gain that username and password by faking out the employee. But this is not them hacking into government systems themselves. Eric, before we go, we're very short on time, but let me ask you quickly, anything in CISPA or CISA that would prevent someone from being able to hack a Twitter account? Absolutely not. No, these, these again, these are things that are looking at the problem after it's happened. And, uh, and they're, you know, they're, they want the tools to be able to collect all the data possible uh, to basically possibly prevent things in the future. But frankly, it usually doesn't work that well. By well, and unfortunately, it feels like we're being sold a bill of goods here that was turned down not too long ago. And it's answers to a problem that aren't actually answers to a problem. Eric Delisle, CEO of iCloak, thanks so much for your time. Thanks, Ben. Well, there are answers to a problem, but not the problem that they're telling you that they're trying to answer. The problem that they're answering is, you know, how do we get back doors in all this, all these places that could possibly withhold information from us? Yeah, they can't get rich without that information. You can't do the blackmail that you need to do without that information. Uh, well, anyway, uh, continuing with the... Uh, expected corruption that we find on every doorstep every corner uh, here is the resident telling us about anti-terrorism insurance Wall Street are experts at making up financial products to keep making more dirty money for themselves. And Congress just voted overwhelmingly to renew a program centered around one such product, terrorism insurance. Yeah, that actually exists. The House just voted 416 to 5 to renew what's called the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act. 
And then the next day, the Senate voted 93 to 4. So all of Congress is really behind the program. This is how it works. Companies like commercial developers, entertainment companies, and stadium owners purchase terrorism insurance from insurance companies. The program Congress just passed makes the government responsible to help insurance companies pay off policyholders should they ever be victims of a terrorist attack and try to cash in those insurance policies. In other words, the program shifts part of the financial responsibility from the insurance companies to taxpayers. Now, this is just a load of crap for many reasons. First, the fact that terrorism insurance even exists and that insurance companies make huge sums of money off of selling it just blows my mind. Then there's the fact that many lenders actually require companies to have this insurance, therefore ensuring there's a market for these policies. Then, of course, there's the fact that the federal government is even involved at all in this racket. And then there's the fact that the program was created in 2002, right after 9-11, because of course insurance companies saw it as an opportunity to sell a new product, and since then, it has never paid out, thus proving how unnecessary it is. But here's the real kicker. Tacked on at the end of the legislation that Congress just overwhelmingly passed is a provision that has zero to do with terrorism or insurance. The provision changes the Dodd-Frank Wall Street reform law so that non-financial institutions no longer have to follow the same regulations as big banks. In other words, the legislation weakens Wall Street regulations put in place by Dodd-Frank. So this stupid Terrorism Risk Insurance Act that Congress just almost unanimously passed not only keeps taxpayers on the hook for the bunk financial product of terrorism insurance, it also weakens the already lame regulations we have to keep Wall Street from screwing the country over again. That's our representatives at work for us people. It's so lame. I'd like to buy some insurance against them, but that's a policy no company in their right mind would ever write. Because Congress is always going to screw things up. Tonight, let's talk about that. Okay, isn't isn't she right on? I just can't. Oh, every way you turn. I, about ten years ago, I was put out of business by. I was a, a Oregon general contractor, HVAC contractor, and uh, I went back to renew my insurance in two thousand four. And well, guess what? Because of nine eleven, everybody decided to raise their insurance rates, and mine was quadrupled. That put me out of business. But you know what? They wanted us on top of quadrupling the insurance from 2000 to 8000 a year they wanted uh, a $75 anti-terrorist surcharge and after careful questioning i found out that there was no payoff for that surcharge insurance today it wasn't for me if there was an attack it wasn't for the company i was working for if there was an attack it wasn't for anybody if i was a, an attacker uh, apparently that's how they tried to build up their coffers again okay well no matter where you turn, you find the corruption. Now, how about turning back to little old Portland, Oregon? And, uh, you know, we've been known as the champion of climate. Uh, apparently, we've been doing some good things in, in the uh, effort to cut back our CO2 emissions and things like that. But, uh, you know, big money corrupts the big politics, and uh, Portland is no different. Can you believe that after all is said and done about this climate problem that we have, that we're actually considering putting a propane uh, terminal right here in Portland, Oregon? Well, the Real News Network, based in Boston, is going to tell you all about it. Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Perez coming to you from Baltimore. Canadian Pembina Pipeline Corporation is planning to build a $500 million propane gas export facility in the city of Portland, Oregon. It will ship 37,000 barrels per day to markets in Asia, making it the first such facility in the United States. The mayor of Portland, Charlie Hale, says that the export terminal will bring much needed revenue to the city 
while local environmentalists are saying it is inconsistent with the numerous plans that the city has already adopted to advance sustainable development. Now joining us from Portland, Oregon to discuss these developments is Daphne Weisham. Daphne is Climate Change Policy Fellow at the Center for Sustainable Economy and Associate Fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies. Daphne, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. So now Portland was recently awarded the title Climate Champion by the White House. Um, how would the new gas propane facility affect the status? Well, that's that's the number one question on everybody's minds, because right now Portland is a leader uh, nationally. They have a plan to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by 80 percent below 1990 levels, not 2007 levels, 1990 levels by 2050, if not sooner. Um, so they are one of the few cities selected by the White House for this honor of climate champion. Now they're proposing to build a, a propane terminal that would increase Portland's contributions to uh, greenhouse gas emissions by somewhere along the line of 43 to 83%. Um, so uh, yesterday there was a hearing and it was packed with people there basically saying this is going to the heart and soul of what Portland stands for and we won't stand for it. Right. Now the mayor has come out saying that this is really going to help the economy of Portland and it will create jobs and tax revenues. Um, tell us what uh, that means and how are the people in the city reacting to that? Well, as a mother in particular, I, I take offense when uh, Pembina and other corporations come in and say they're going to generate tax revenues for the schools, that we'll be able to hire more teachers. This is the same line that we hear from other extractive industries like the timber industry. Uh, they link the budget for clear cutting Oregon's forests directly to the budgets for schools. Unfortunately, there is a direct connection. Um, so we heard that yesterday from Pembina. Um, we also heard that they were going to provide uh, union jobs at this terminal, even though uh, very few jobs would actually result. They promised green power. Um, they were all but rolling out the red carpet for everybody there. But uh, uh, those of us who understand what this means for the future of the planet, for our children in particular, were not fooled. So, Daphne, I know that local battles are important and that the environmental movement needs to tackle decisions locally in mm. order to deal with the emissions and climate change. But why should uh, the rest of us nationally be concerned about what's happening in Portland? Well, first of all, Pembina is the largest pipeline service company in the Canadian tar sands, okay? They have tried to get this propane out through other ports and they have failed, just as they're failing to get their uh, bitumen out through the Keystone XL pipeline thus far. President Obama has threatened to veto that if, it, if, it, uh, if the bill does come to his desk. So Pimbina is not just some small Canadian company. They're the largest in the tar sands. And they set their sights on Portland, thinking uh, they could push this through over the holidays without any resistance. Uh, but they were dead wrong. There were quite a few people there, including uh, the longshoremen who came out in opposition to this particular uh, propane terminal saying would not result in significant job increases. Uh, we've got religious leaders and others. Um, what I see this battle being about is the death throes of the fossil fuel industry, starting with the most carbon intensive of fossil fuels. We already see the coal industry essentially uh, being phased out in the United States. And tar sands are at least as as uh, uh, damaging to climate stability as coal. Uh, propane is yet another subsidy for what is currently an uneconomic um, uh, market for the tar sands because the price of oil is so low. It makes tar sands that much more uh, uncompetitive compared to uh, regular oil. So this particular um, project, because of the demand for propane in uh, Asian countries to be turned into propylene, which is actually a very toxic food additive. Uh, it's also being made, uh, turned into plastics. Because the demand is so high, we see this particular terminal as a yet another subsidy for the tar sands, and we're saying no. And, and nationally, as well as globally, this is really contrary to the kind of commitments that President Obama has just recently made uh, in terms of an agreement with China to reduce carbon emissions. 
Exactly, exactly. And, you know, I mean, I think what, what we need to uh, keep in mind is this is this is also a health and safety issue. I mean, Oregon and Washington, the entire Northwest is just being flooded with oil uh, uh, trains, gas trains, LPG trains, coal trains. And um, I live within uh, a mile of, of coal tracks. We hear them all night long. They could be exploding as they have in Canada. Um, of course, the fracking process um, is very toxic to human health, as we know, thanks to uh, some studies that have been coming out on, on the chemicals that they use in the fracking process. Um, uh, propane can be derived from both fracked gas and from refined oil from the tar sands. So we, we see this as both a human health concern, a public safety concern. We know that the first responders are basically just saying we're going to have to throw up our hands if there is such an, an accident on the rails. Uh, this is uh, competing with other much more sustainable products uh, getting to port because our, our rails are getting so jammed with all this fossil fuel. Um, so uh, we think we can win this one. And we certainly have no intention of, of turning Portland into a fossil fuel export town. It's, it's one of the greenest cities in the country. We want to keep it that way. All right. Daphne, all thank right. you so much. I cut it off short because we have limited time. And what I'm going to do right now, we have a, a about a 16 or 17 minute clip, but we don't have that much time left. We only have about 12 minutes. So we're going to start the clip and go out on it. You'll see the credits roll and then we'll see you again next week. This one is a, a clip by James Corbett. And it's a, it's a collaboration between Japan and the United States. One, the media monarchy here in Portland, Oregon, and the James Corbett, the Corbett Report in Japan get together to make this weekly report and uh it's worth going to their website and check it out you know either corbettreport.com or mediamonarchy.com anyway we're going to go ahead and play it this is about the fbi extending its claws i mean the irs extending its claws sorry i got them all alphabet soup uh the internal revenue service extending its claws beyond the united states and it's Something to be expected, I guess, if there's money involved. Welcome back to the New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. James, a lot to get to this week, and we'll just jump right to it. I'll set them up, and you knock them down. We'll take this first one from Zero Hedge. Beware the odds of the IRS as the International Data Exchange Service launches. The IRS announced the International Data Exchange Service, IDES. If you've not heard of it, it's an outgrowth of another insidious thing you might not have heard of called the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, FATCA, which requires every single bank in the world to get into bed with the IRS to share info about customers. Like any other bankrupt government, the U.S. government has taken to intimidating its own citizens and the entire world in an attempt to make ends meet. Their hope was that the majority of people committing tax evasion would come clean and that the result, it would have some big boost in tax revenue. But the fact is tax revenues actually haven't improved at all. Looking at tax revenue as a percentage of GDP, the numbers haven't budged at all from their long-term average. FATCA hasn't done anything positive for Americans. That said, FATCA, which looks exactly like, like fat cat, it's what your, your brain wants to finish the, the word. FATCA has managed to destroy what little remaining credibility the U.S. government still had. Bear in mind, these are the people that spy on their allies, drop bombs by remote control, and force-fed people negative real interest rates and $18 trillion in debt. But if that weren't enough, FATCA goes after foreigners with absurd logistical challenges commanding every single bank on the planet to comply. The ultimate irony, there are nations in the world that aren't recognized by the United States. The Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, Abkhazia, and more. Yet banks in these regions still have to sign up with the IRS. It's as though they don't exist, but they still must comply. The IRS claims so far that 145,000 financial institutions, that's 145,000 banks essentially, have already signed on to the information sharing agreements. Now with the launch of IDES, they have an online platform to invade customer privacy at every one of those banks and will include related links 
one from Forbes that actually gives you links to the IDES website and how you can submit, essentially, and lots of handy, handy links. IRS unleashes global FATCA data exchange, offshore transparency everywhere, James. Well, you stole the words right out of my mouth. The Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, FATCA. If we could just buy a T, perhaps a tyranny would uh, fit the bill and we can get Fat Cat in there. Um, this is extremely important on the global scale, not simply for Americans and the IRS and the American tax situation, although obviously that's the particular focus here. But I think the idea of what is being set up through this international data exchange service is exactly the infrastructure that will, I have no doubt, be used in one form or another, even as just a template for this new global tax compliance agreement that's being worked out between the OECD nations now with however many dozens of countries signed on that are going to start sharing tax data amongst uh, countries, including data on your personal bank account and, uh, and uh, all sorts of personal details are going to be shared amongst all these nations in the effort, of course, of trying to crack down on those corporations that hide their billions offshore. It's certainly not to get the average person, but, oh, they just might be scooped up in this net as well. So this is the framework for what global government really will be. It really will rest on a tax base that will be uh, brought about through this type of net. And so this is extremely important for us to understand this infrastructure, and I think we probably need to, uh, to continue looking at it, and hopefully I can line up someone for an interview you to talk a little bit more in detail about what this is and what it's doing, but welcome to the New World Order. It's it's already here, and it's already being constructed behind the scenes without most people in the world even catching on, so thank you, James, for bringing this to our attention. Well, and we thank a lot of the folks out there who submit stories to us using hashtag New World Next Week, and speaking of, of hashtags and the web, of course, all of these things are going to be spread out, James, on however many hundreds of thousands of new computer networks. So it's all sure to be hacked in no time. So our other re related link to this first story, I'll tie in the embattled IMF head, Christine Lagarde, actually just a few hours ago from when I speak to you now, says global economic outlook still grim, even with all that cheap oil flowing here in America as, as folks are enjoying record low gas prices. So having said that, James, we'll move to our second story to the UK, where a story from The Telegraph, and again submitted to us via Twitter using hashtag Neural Next Week from our man at G.J. Salisbury, genetically modified crops could be planted in England this year. GM crops could be planted in England this year despite widespread opposition following a landmark ruling in Europe. The European Parliament approved a deal on Tuesday, January 13th, which will let countries decide for themselves whether they want to plant GM crops. British scientists are firmly behind genetic modification, believing that it could help farmers produce plants which are healthier and need fewer pesticides. The newer legislation, which will be in place by spring 2015, could mean that commercial GM crops, including maize and oilseed rape, are grown in Britain from this year. And it opens the door for genetically modified fruits and vegetables to be sold in British supermarkets. Under the new rules, each European country will be allowed to decide for itself whether or not to grow GM once it's been ruled safe by the European Food Safety Authority, EFSA, the EU's food safety body. The deal, James, as we jump down in the article, has been engineered by the British government who are fed up that GM trials continue to be blocked by Germany France and Italy. And I think if we were to hope that GM crops and these things hadn't already, as, as we see they do, leaked and contaminated in the UK, we were probably kind of dreaming anyway. But we we're always able here in the States to kind of point to the EU and the UK and say they ban them there or they at least label them there. Why can't we have similar things here in the States? But now that'll be completely thrown out the window. And James, the, the other part I would say is you know, to those British scientists behind genetic modification, believing it could help farmers produce plants which are healthier, which has already been shown to not be true, and need fewer pesticides, which has already shown to not be true. So we can tell them right now, neither of those two things are going to happen. James. <laughs> 
you're exactly right about that. And this is an interesting story for me because it's a conflict of principles. I mean, as people know who have watched The Corbett Report or New World Next Week or any of our content for a long time, yes, I am completely opposed to genetically modified organisms in this grand uncontrolled experiment with the genome of the planet, the biosphere itself that's ongoing with these. But the other principal operative here is the idea of the European Food Safety Agency dictating to all of Europe its food safety guidelines and principles. And if they happen to have a good one, like you must uh, not do these GM trials, then we're all yay and, and that's a good thing. But, you know, the the exact same power that the EFCA, EFSA has to, to say that you can't do GM trials is the same power that they could use to say you can do GM trials, or you must do GM trials, or whatever else they want to dictate to all of these states. So I think the principle here has to be that the EFSA shouldn't be the ones dictating to each individual country. It should be up to the people in Britain to stop the British government from implementing this. And obviously that's a completely different fight, but I think that the principle has to be decentralization, and it has to be as local as possible, because there's nothing whatsoever that any average British citizen can do to affect in any way the the principles or guidelines of the EFSA, they at least have some sort of chance of influencing what's happening in Britain and more of a chance what's happening locally in their own councils. So again, we have to devolve power as much as possible. And I think that's got to be the principle with these food regulations as well, because again, it's going to come down to what we can actually do about this. And uh, the when it's left to supranational bodies like the EFSA, the answer is nothing. There's nothing you can do that's going to affect their policies. So we have to get the power devolved as much as possible and bring the fight um, bring the fight home if that's uh, if that's where it's going to be we'll remind folks as as I was just thinking about as you were, as you were talking James I was like where did I just see the the phrase gorilla gardening and it's a new episode that you just put out in your solution series gorilla gardening so we'll include a link to that and also just a reminder of, of our very previous episode of the new world next week where our, our final story there was a, a good news story about community gardens that our friend Brock West has gotten involved with. And, and the response has been overwhelmingly positive, James. As it should be. Again, this, these are the solutions that we can actually do something about. And we can't necessarily control what's happening out there, but we can control what's happening in our homes, at least to the extent that we grow it ourselves and, and trade with people that we know. So again, the solutions start at home. And and speaking sort of, of of growing it ourselves and with trying to maintain the idea, James, I don't want to write checks we can't cash here. And you and I have talked about it, I think, probably on air and off that we'd love to think that we could have a good news story every week on the New World Next Week. The world isn't that dire yet that we can't find these these positive things. So we're going to keep trying to give you positive news stories fraught with other implications and complications as they're they're bound to be at least we still want to kind of go with with something higher so to speak so we'll do this again submitted to us not with new world next week but with good news next week from at apex js via twitter a 15 year old unveils an